Hey guys, this is uh, Rudy for Best Investor coming at you from the entertainment capital of the world, Palm Beach. And uh, let's uh, sort of take a look at what's going on today because uh, lots of uh, lots of things in the news, lots of things happening, lots of moving parts. And uh, I hope some of it has been uh, good for you to today. So uh, let's quickly uh, catch up on what's happening in the news and uh, see uh, sort of what the headlines are. And then we can talk a little bit about um, some of your favorite stocks and mine. Um, but to start off with, uh, Amazon is paying $8.5 billion for MGM, uh, which is kind of cool, right? MGM has uh, a whole lot of uh, really cool um, franchises in their portfolio, including uh, movies like uh, The Pink Panther, the 1969 moon landing. Oh wait, no, that's a conspiracy theory. Um, James Bond, etc. So um, interesting, right? So uh, Amazon is paying $8.5 billion for MGM. Around about the same time, the Senate in the US decided that uh, Bezos needs a $10 billion bailout for his uh, spaceship program. Anyway, let's go to the important news. So um, a couple of things that are interesting over, over here. Uh, P.P. Lamb said, uh, Tell took off today. Is it because of your video? Of course, it's because of my video. I said, must be LOL. Congrats to the Tell Longs, especially Ozelito, who uh, first drew my attention to Tell. Uh, some comments about crypto related to the previous thing, but what, to the previous video. But what I really wanted to share with you is um, this uh, question here by uh, Greg, our friend Greg. I think uh, Greg, if I remember correctly, you live somewhere in Canada, right? Toronto or something like that. Anyway, Greg says, I would be curious about your take on this article. If you have the will to do a video related to it, well, Greg, I will. So uh, I looked at the article and uh, had a read through and um, what I did was I actually sort of um, copied the article into a PDF. So it's easier for me to kind of tr keep track and read it. But um, anyway, uh, here it is on screen. So uh, this is the guy, Jonathan Weber. He's, he says, um, is Occidental Petroleum a buy or a sell? Who the heck is Jonathan Weber? He is a junior analyst at Cashflow Kingdom, an engineer by trade. Jonathan has become a full-time stock analyst. Why would an engineer by trade become a full-time stock analyst? Um, Cashflow Kingdom, the company where he works, obviously makes uh, good money. You know? So um, I don't know. If I had the uh, choice between writing for a penny a click and being an engineer, I'd probably choose to be an engineer. But uh, hey to each his own. Oxy has long been a favorite among retail investors, but that may not be justified at all. The company has some strengths for sure, such as, such as an attractive asset footprint. Jonathan goes on to say there are major issues as well, and the shares are not sufficiently inexpensive, I believe. Well, Jonathan, to start off with, um, we, speaking on behalf of my uh, smart community over here, are not really interested in what you believe. We are more interested in facts. So let's take a look at some of his, his uh, facts in the article because many of his facts are true and uh, many of his opinions are well grounded in some really good narratives. Occidental has been a retail favorite for years due to favor uh, factors such as healthy fundamentals, solid growth and its dividend track record. Of course the latter part, the dividend track record is something from before which is no longer valid. Following a major capital allocation mistake, now, Jonathan uh, repeats this a, a few times throughout the article, a major capital allocation mistake. Uh, not necessarily in those words, but you'll see it comes up every now and then if you go through the article. Occidental Petroleum is a leading U.S. upstream producer that primarily pumps oil in the Permian Basin, as well as, as, well as in some other areas. Uh, it goes on to say the company does not have a large downstream or chemicals business. Uh, these things are all true. Not surprisingly, Occidental's petroleum stock price has thus fared badly during 2020. I think by now we all know that. He's got some charts here to, uh, to prove his point. Uh, the horrible chart when you look at it over a period of one year, despite the uh, uptick of the last few months. Over the last three years, Jonathan says, shares have been down more than 70%, which made Occidental Petroleum an abysmal investment for those who bought near the highs. Very quickly, I can tell you that my son was one of the people who bought near the highs. In fact, he... Um, had two, two tranches of Occidental stock that he paid uh, respectively $56 and $51 for. What he did was he actually bought it on the way down as well. So he actually um, has a cost basis now of around $15, but not because he bought 
lots and lots and lots of stock on the way down, mainly because what he did was for tax loss harvesting, he sold these expensive shares, which is called first in, first out. And because he sold those expensive shares, he took a huge hit on paper, uh, which he could offset against profit, which was taxable income on the other side of the ledger. And uh, by selling those expensive shares, he dropped his cost basis down to um, uh, you know, the high teens or early 20s or whatever. And his cost basis is basically his own mind. So um, there are ways to play these trades. It's not, not such a big deal. But anyway, uh, yeah, if you bought it near the top and uh, you held on to it, then you're down more than 70%. Um, and then he says, for those who managed to time the bottom in 2020, the shares have been way more rewarding. However, as Oxy is up more than 180% from his 52 week low, all these things are true. The rise in Oxy shares in 2021 was mirrored by many other oil companies that also saw their shares rise by a lot this year, including picks such as EOG and S. These things are true as well. On top of that, well, he says Oxy has its issues. Not everything is bad, uh, as many attractive um, assets in the Permian, which make up a little less than half of Oxy's production volumes. Oxy is able to drill at advantageous costs and with compelling cash flow profiles. On top of that, thanks to being very upstream focused, Oxy benefits a lot from rising oil prices. A company like Royal Dutch Shell, for example, with its diversified assets and vast downstream operations has less leveraging leverage to an increase oil price. So uh, Jonathan says um, there are sort of better stocks like EOG and S. Uh, that's not necessarily incorrect. Uh, and then he says a company like Royal Dutch Shell, we're going to come back to this one in a minute because there's a reason why I've kind of paused here, um, has less leverage to an increasing oil price. Oxy sees its cash flows and earnings rise quite a lot in a scenario where oil prices continue to climb. This makes Occidental Petroleum a highly leveraged oil play. These things are all true. Oxy's cash flows could, uh, for example, rise by another almost a billion dollars per year if WTI rises by another five dollars. Well, we know that they generate approximately two hundred uh, million dollars um, in cash flow. Um, it's about one hundred and eighty million dollars if you average out the uh, WTI and Brent production. Uh, so five times two hundred is about a billion, and that's where he gets the nine hundred twenty-five million from. Oxy holds one of the largest asset bases in the United States with vast positions in the Permian Basin. This does not only allow the company to produce for many more years, at least under the condition that regulation, regulators and politicians do not interfere, but it also results in cost synergies and operating leverage, which keeps its expenses low. It's all good news. Apart from these opportunities and strength, there are major issues that any investor should consider. I'm not going to go into detail on this one. Uh, by now, you know that Wall Street has beat up Occidental, beat down Occidental because of high debt levels for years. The fact of the matter is in the last earnings call, Rob Peterson, the uh, CFO said that um, they expect by the end of the year to have the uh, long-term debt down to 25 billion from its current level of around 33, 34 billion. So almost $10 billion in uh, debt is expected to be repaid just this year. Of course, at the current uh, prices, Occidental is uh, literally almost printing money. Um, he goes on to talk about Occidental's debt. I'm not going to read you the uh, entire article here. And then he uh, explains why stocks like ConocoPhillips might be better. So now you have three, you have Hess and EOG and ConocoPhillips, which he says is better. Despite these issues, Oxy shares are not trading at an especially low valuation. Instead, shares are trading at a premium compared to how some of the major upstream players are valued right now. And here he compares Oxy to three of them that I just, uh, two of them that I just mentioned, EOG, ConocoPhillips and Apache. Um, Oxy trades at a premium compared to companies such as EOG, ConocoPhillips and APA. This doesn't seem justified. Is Oxy a buy or a sell? Um, if you want to speculate on higher oil prices, Jonathan says, um, Oxy could be a viable pick if uh, oil prices climb to $70, $80 or even higher. Uh, then he goes on to say, as almost like a disclaimer, almost every company will do well uh, if the price goes to uh, of WTI goes to $70, $80 or even higher. Um, he says short, the Oxy shares do not have a lot of upside because Oxy already trades at a high valuation compared to many of its peers. Well, we're going to have to see about that because uh, 
my crystal ball is cracked. So uh, I'm not sure I can uh, counter that one with, uh, with, with, with confidence because we'll just have to see how we go. But anyway, your remarks again about EOG and ConocoPhillips. Um, and then he puts in his little advertisement at the bottom, the primary goal of cash flow kingdom income portfolio is to produce an overall yield in the seven to 10% range. I think you can achieve that quite easily with uh, Occidental, uh, Jonathan, but if you're looking for a steady income from a dividend point of view, which is obviously what they um, like to achieve, we accomplish this by combining several different income streams to form an attractive steady portfolio payout. Uh, portfolio's price can fluctuate, but the income stream remains consistent. It's because there's a large dividend play in place here. And if you're looking for dividends, then um, you probably should not be in Occidental Petroleum. Um, at the moment anyway, with its uh, yield, which is ridiculously little. Then he says at the bottom, I am long Royal Dutch Shell and Berkshire Hathaway. So uh, at the start of the article, he actually makes mention of the fact that uh, his Royal Dutch Shell uh, doesn't benefit from the same leverage of a higher oil price as does, for instance, Occidental, and then uses numerous advent uh, other, um, he, he lists uh, a number of other companies like EOG and ConocoPhillips and that, that uh, he probably should be invested in if he's looking for a, a nice dividend yield and a stock that's undervalued compared to Occidental. He does say somewhere in the article now, and I may have missed it, sorry that I'm scrolling so wildly here. So uh, if you guys are getting dizzy, just put the uh, YouTube video on, on pause for a second. Um, he says, I personally wouldn't short Oxy either but rate it and avoid for now. So we know that the majority of analysts are either saying hold or buy. Um, no one really is saying sell. If, you, if you're not willing to short it, then you don't believe that the price is gonna go down. So uh, that kind of has me sort of questioning the thesis, like exactly what is the point here? So um, Greg, um, it's an interesting article. Uh, it's mostly true. Uh, and then you could ask me, so, uh, you know, Mr. Oxy, if you still want to call me that, where do you put your money? So uh, what's other, the other thing that's interesting about um, Jonathan's article is that just today, uh, the Dutch court, a Dutch court ruled, well, John, giant shell must cut carbon emissions by 45% by 2030 in a landmark case. This is going to hurt Jonathan's holding uh, and his long position in Royal Dutch Shell, methinks. So uh, we'll have to see what happens there. I do want to share just a couple of other little things with you quickly. So um, on this one here, uh, this guy tweeted, he says, I keep my equity investing simple, high quality, simple businesses only. In other words, businesses I can only understand. I rarely buy, very, very, very rarely sell. So um, I uh, rarely buy as well. In fact, I probably buy more than this guy, uh, but I very, very, rarely sell. I'm not very inclined to sell the uh, positions that I have, although I sometimes exit for a huge profit with using a trailing stock, but otherwise I um, generally just keep. So I'm talking about my long positions here, right? So when I buy, I literally just um, buy and hold. Equal sizing of positions at cost. Now I've shared videos before where I've showed you sort of a pie chart of my uh, stocks that I hold. And as a general rule, um, I do have some speculative positions and I'm going to talk about one of those in just a minute. Um, but uh, the long positions that I hold sort of have an equal sizing. So um, if I have uh, in energy stocks, uh, Pembina, Enbridge, Occidental, Total, and energy transfer, and in one of them I have significantly less than the others, I might be inclined to buy, say, energy transfer because it's the smallest position of the five that I just mentioned. Um, you can say to me, uh, are you buying Occidental at 25 bucks? The answer is no. I'm just holding Occidental at 25 bucks. I am not buying Occidental, but I am buying energy. So I just mentioned a second ago that I'm adding to my energy transfer position. I've actually added in uh, three of my accounts over the past uh, week or so as energy transfer dip just below 10. I picked up some more. He says he only holds 15 stocks and three mutual funds. I don't hold any mutual funds at all because most mutual funds have nosebleed fees. Uh, I actually hold... Um, a basket of, of several stocks and you can look back in my video libraries you'll see what stocks I hold and I do have not mutual funds but I do have a couple of ETFs so I have uh, VYM and I have SPY uh, those are the two larger ones that I that I hold then he says he doesn't attend any annual general meetings no conference calls only annual reports I do um, sometimes listen in on the conference calls just because I don't have a life 
uh, and I find them quite interesting in terms of getting myself updated on some of my largest positions in my portfolio. So Mr. Roxy, where is the money going? My money is going into um, positions where I'm rebalancing, like I just mentioned, energy transfer is an example of that, where I've been buying, um, buying energy transfer at about 10 bucks, because as I've said to many people on the channel, your chances of energy transfer going from $10 to say $20 is just as good or bad as your chances of um, your Bitcoin uh, holdings going from $40,000 a Bitcoin to $80,000 a Bitcoin. The only difference is energy transfer also owns uh, miles and miles and miles of pipelines, uh, Sunoco and a whole lot of other assets and they print free cash as if it's going out of fashion. So that's where the money's going. And then uh, let me, before I go to energy fuels, let me just quickly go to, uh, to tell. So uh, yesterday I made a video, uh, or was it the day before? I don't even know what day it is, on uh, Tellurian, Tellurian, however you say it. Um, that was prompted by Joselito. Uh, this uh, company today spiked 14%. So you see what happens? Mr. Roxy makes a video about something he doesn't even understand or know anything about, and the stock spike spikes 14% in one day. Good job. Well done, everybody who is long in Telluru, 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 whatever you call it. Uh, where is my other money going? So the energy investments that I'm making right now are in small caps. It's mostly in uranium or sort of a blend of uh, uranium and other energy type stocks. One of the uh, stocks that I bought into and have added to the position since I first bought into it is energy fuels. So energy fuels, much like Tellurian, also had quite a nice day today. And the reason for that is that energy fuels we're trading higher after Noble Capital Markets, the investment bank, upgraded the stock from market perform to outperform and slapped a $9 price target onto the stock. Uh, that caused uh, a nice bounce for Energy Fuels. Energy Fuels is a leading uh, uranium company in the United States, and they also do rare earth minerals, and they also mine vanadium. They have cash in the bank, they have no debt, and they have a lot of inventory on hand. Um, and this company is a little gem which I found as a result of uh, Luke, whom you can follow on Twitter at Thinly Spread. Um, that's one of them. The, uh, the other companies that I've invested in, uh, which have done really nicely for me, um, are Paladin. That's the uh, Australian uh, uranium miner that owns the Heinrich Langer mine in uh, Namibia. I also invested in GoVX, which is uh, a Canadian company headquartered in Montreal. Um, they also have mining assets, uh, uranium mining assets in Africa. And the other one that I uh, invested in is Cameco. And uh, Cameco is a Canadian company who own um, uranium assets uh, in the prairies of Canada. I think uh, most of their assets are in um, Saskatchewan. Uh, but anyway, th that's kind of where the money is going. So if you say, um, you know, what is it that you're investing in? Uh, are you buying more Oxy? The answer is no, I'm not buying more Oxy. I'm holding my position. Uh, I have several thousand shares in Occidental Petroleum, so I'm just holding that. I'm not adding to it. Uh, if Oxy were to drop below $20 a share, I'll probably add to, uh, to the position. In fact, I might be tempted if it drops below $22 a share. But I don't really think in the near future we'll see that price again. We're more likely to go to 35 than 25 uh, from this point forward. Um, but, you know, the market is, is, um, is fluid and, um, and the guys who make the news for us uh, always come up with something new, you know, like inventory levels or some outbreak of coronavirus in India, a new Indian variant, whatever the case might be. Uh, the market manipulators are at work every single second of the day, so you just need to pay attention to the macro. So the money, by the way, um, the cash, which I've allocated to um, positions such as energy transfer and um, the uh, small cap uranium stocks, not that all of them are small, you, uh, Chemico is a five, $6 billion corporation. Um, but but the, the cash that I allocated to those companies, so energy transfer, uh, energy fuels, Chemico, um, GoVX, Paladin, um, that cash came from uh, an exit. And as I said at the beginning of the video, I don't exit stocks too often, but I did exit Pfizer. So on Pfizer, I had a trailing stock plug plugged in and I actually exited the entire position. So um, I cashed the profit and um, basically took back my capital. And then I was looking to reallocate that capital. Uh, more than half of it has gone to energy transfer. 
and the other half of it I split between five different companies. Uh, one was Antero Resources, but I no longer have Antero Resources because I sold it at a gain of about 25% also using a trading stock. Uh, but I still hold the others. So I have um, energy transfer, uh, which is the bulk of my Pfizer cash. And then the other ones are energy fuels, uh, Cameco, GoVX, and Paladin. Those are my sort of uranium plays. High risk, more speculative. Uh, that would be more like um, Joselito's play on uh, Telerun or however you say that one. Anyway, um, if you guys are making money out there today, and I hope today was a good day for you, that's great. Uh, so on that happy note, this is Mr. Roxy saying thanks for watching. Take care. Stay away from COVID and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.